back to our discussion on the urinary system. Uh, so just a recap of some of the main things that we talked about last time. We started down at the very bottom of the urinary system, so we started talking about the bladder, and then we worked our way up from the function of the bladder, then to the ureters, and now we're finally at the kidneys. So all we've really discussed so far with the kidneys is blood flow coming into the kidneys from the renal arteries, and then how that renal artery is going to eventually branch into interlobar arteries, which will then produce a uh, afferent arterioles, which you can see here, are bringing oxygen-rich but also to be filtered blood, so blood that is not quite uh, treated yet by the kidneys, into the nephron, which is the uh, unit of filtration in the kidneys. So we're bringing blood into this capillary structure called the glomerulus, and we spent some time talking about how this is the part of the nephron where our filtration occurs, where we take bulk materials from the blood, mostly we're talking about water, salts, sugars, things that are small enough and are able to pass through those three different barriers of uh, the glomerular uh, uh, structure. And then afterwards, we produce a filtrate, which, as we discussed, is about 180 liters of filtrate per day. That's way too much. So now we're going to continue our discussion by talking about the other parts of the nephron, which mainly are going to focus on reabsorbing materials back into the blood plasma, mainly water. That's our main concern. And then we'll also talk about some parts of the nephron in terms of salt reabsorption, salt secretion, and then the secretion of other things that we need to accomplish before we end up with our final urine product to be delivered to the bladder via the ureters so that we can excrete it out of our body. So before we go any further, keep in mind the main thing that we're going to discuss here is water reabsorption. The challenge we are currently faced with is after filtration has occurred, we, re we uh, filter about seven and a half liters of water per hour, 180 liters per day. That's way too much, right? So we need to reabsorb a whole bunch of it back into the bloodstream. How are we going to do that though? So water, in the case of filtration, was able to move through those fenestrations in the glomerular capillaries. It was able to go through the basal lamina. It was able to make it through the slit diaphragm. So there really wasn't anything in particular restricting the flow of water from the blood plasma and into Bowman's capsule. But things are going to be a little bit different here. Now that water, and among other things, is in the nephron, if those things are going to make it back into the blood, they're going to have to move across solid cell membranes. We're no longer talking about fenestrations. So let's do a little bit of review here from much earlier in the semester. So in order for water to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, it has to diffuse from the filtrate, which is inside of the nephron structure, across the cell membranes of the cells that make up the nephron tubules, and then back into the blood. So what do we call it when water diffuses across a membrane? So if you said osmosis, you are correct. So this was a major discussion in unit one of this semester. So we are seeing it come screaming back here in unit five. So let's make sure that we're uh, on the same page regarding the rules that dictate when and how osmosis occurs. So for osmosis to occur, for water to move across a membrane, water must flow down its concentration gradient. So when we're talking about a concentration gradient, whether it's water moving or sodium moving or glucose moving or whatever, when a molecule moves down its concentration gradient, how does it move from high or low concentration to high or low concentration? So if we're talking about water here, water is going to move from areas of high water concentration to areas of low water concentration. That is the way that passive transport always works. Molecules move downhill from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. But if you will recall, more often than not, uh, solutions are not reported in terms of water concentration. They are reported in terms of solute concentration. And when we're talking about bodily fluids that have many, many solutes dissolved within the water solvent, they are reported in terms of total solute concentration, which is also called osmolarity or osmolality. So if we're thinking about this in terms of osmolarity, we're going to have to kind of flip our thinking back on its head. We just said 
high water to low water. So if we're thinking about it in terms of solute, you want to think of water always moving via osmosis from areas of low osmolarity to areas of high osmolarity. And the way to think about that is if a solution has a very low osmolarity, a very small percentage of that solution is made up of solute. And as a consequence, a very high percentage of that solution is made up of the solvent, which in this case is water. Conversely, if you've got a solution that has a very high osmolarity, more and more of that solution is made up of solute and less and less is made up of actual water. So really saying that water moves from low osmolarity to high osmolarity is exactly the same thing as saying water's moving from high water concentration to low water concentration. So the idea here is that if we want to promote water reabsorption from the filtrate back into the blood plasma, we need the osmolarity of the filtrate to be less than that of the blood plasma itself. If we can accomplish that, water should passively diffuse via osmosis from the filtrate into the blood plasma itself. So here is the issue right from the get-go. So we mentioned back in part one of this video series that filtration is kind of a bulk movement of materials. There's not really, really any discernment of what makes it across and what doesn't, at least in terms of concentration. Now we talked about the three barriers to filtrate formation. So things are either going to be mostly pre completely prevented or not prevented at all. So for the things that are not prevented at all, things like water, salts, glucose, etc., when these materials move from the blood plasma and into the filtrate, their concentration is going to be almost exactly what it was in the blood. So because the osmolarity of the blood plasma was 300 milliosmolar, the, cons the osmolarity of the filtrate is also going to be 300 milliosmoles as well. So there's our first problem. How are we going to reabsorb any water if the two osmolarities that we are comparing are exactly the same? So that's kind of our problem, right? So uh, just a little bit further on. So uh, just to make sure that we're aware before we kind of tackle that issue that we just brought up, just to make sure that you're aware, uh, once we get our filtrate here in Bowman's capsule, it is going to move down through the rest of the nephron, so to the proximal tubules, to the loop of Henle, and so on. So at that point, when we're talking about water reabsorption, we're not talking about getting that water back into the glomerular blood. We're talking about those intertubular capillaries that are kind of intertwined, kind of like a spider web with the rest of the nephron. So you might want to go back at the picture we looked at earlier. So water reabsorption does not go uh, from the filtrate straight into the glomerulus. So we're going to talk about all the blood vessels that, all the capillaries that branch off of those efferent arterioles that come out the other side of the glomerulus. So here is how we are going to get past our problem. The osmolarity of the blood plasma, as it ever was, is 300 milliosmolar. The osmolarity of the filtrate right now is 300 milliosmolar. That's a problem. We can't get any net osmosis to occur if it stays that way. So we are going to get kind of creative here. We are going to play a little trick to get water to move by following salts. So here's what we're going to do. This area that you see right here with all these blue arrows is the proximal convoluted tubule. It is the area of the nephron that is just downstream from Bowman's capsule. So what we're going to do, we know that as long as those two osmolarities that we were comparing, as long as they are equal, no water is going to move. So what are we going to do? We are going to force the osmolarity of the filtrate to change. And what we are going to do here is these endothelial cells that make up the outer part of the proximal tubule, they are going to start active transport. You remember active transport? Well, what we're doing here is we are actively transporting salt. We are actively transporting both sodium and chloride. So what we are doing here is that by active transport, we are pumping sodium and chloride from an area of low concentration in the filtrate 
to an area of high concentration out here in the extracellular fluid. You can think of that as simultaneously both the interstitial fluid and the blood plasma. So this active transport is pumping sodium and chloride from the filtrate into the interstitial fluid, into the extracellular fluid. So think about this. If the osmolarity to start with in the filtrate is 300 milliosmolar and we are pumping solutes out, what is going to happen to the value of the osmolarity of that filtrate? So don't forget, the total osmolarity is basically the total concentration of solute divided by the volume of the solution or the volume of the water. So if we are pumping out solute without changing the amount of water there, we expect the osmolarity here to start going down. And because the salts are going to the extracellular fluid, we expect the osmolarity there to go up. So as a consequence, as soon as we start pumping those salts out, the osmolarity in the extracellular fluid will go up, the osmolarity in the filtrate will go down, and what did we just say is the prerequisite for osmosis occurring? We want water to move from areas of low osmolarity to areas of high osmolarity. So because the filtrate is now a low osmolarity solution and the extracellular fluid is now a high osmolarity solution, water molecules from the filtrate are going to basically start uh, riding on the coattails of sodium and chloride that we're leaving via active transport. So this is what we call water following the salt transport, right? So we get the salts to move first, that momentarily changes the osmolarity, and then water will follow. And as the water follows, we basically start restoring the osmolarity back to what it was at 300. So this is kind of the trick that we play to get a good deal of water reabsorption accomplished. So because the salts in the water are moving out of the proximal tubule in proportionate amounts, the amount of salt that we transport out is roughly proportional to the water that we transport out in terms of osmolarity. After all of this occurs, the osmolarity of the filtrate is still going to be about 300 milliosmolar. Now, we did change it momentarily pumping that salt out, but when the water uh, followed out, it went right back to 300. So the major thing that we have accomplished here uh, in the proximal tubule is we have reduced the overall volume of the filtrate by about 65%, all without even changing the osmolarity of the filtrate. That's really an extraordinary accomplishment at this point. It's incredible. So we talked about how 180 liters of filtrate per day, that's kind of astounding. So we need to reabsorb a whole bunch of that water back. We need to reabsorb about 98 to 99% back. Well, we've already accomplished about 65% of that. So we are well on our way at this point. But what we are now going to need to accomplish throughout the rest of the nephron is we are going to need to reabsorb some more water. We still have some more of that to do. And we're need, going to need to do some salt reabsorption. So let's start talking about that. So just to kind of orient you here, uh, Bowman's capsule here at the interface between Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus, this is where we did all of our filtration. Then the filtrate at 300 milliosmolar moved through the proximal tubule here, everything that you see highlighted in this purple rectangle here. So we just accomplished a great deal of water reabsorption there, all without changing the osmolarity of the filtrate itself. Again, very extraordinary accomplishment. So that overwhelming volume of filtrate that we made in Bowman's capsule, we greatly reduce it. We re reduce it by about 65% all due to the active transport of sodium and chloride and then water followed by osmosis. Uh, the proximal tubule here is very high, highly permeable to water. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, what makes a cell permeable to water versus a cell that is not permeable to water. So the filtrate that is now going to move to the next part of the nephron is still going to be isoosmotic with the blood, meaning it has the same osmolarity.
So after water gets reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, what's left of it, about 35% that's left of uh, the initial filtrate, it's still at 300 milliosmolar. So you can see up here, 300 milliosmolar is our filtrate. That filtrate is now going to pass to the next part of the nephron, which is called the loop of Henle. So what we're going to accomplish here is we are going to accomplish two major things. We are going to get a little bit more water reabsorption to occur. There's still going to be about 15% of the original filtrate volume that is going to escape uh, the loop of Henle and move on to the distal convoluted tubule. But one of the major things that we're going to accomplish here is we are going to do a whole bunch of salt reabsorption here. So the first thing that I want you to just take note of, just take note of it for the time being, we can talk about it a little later, notice how the loop of Henle is just at the interface between the cortex and the medulla. So you'll remember how I asked you to take note of earlier how the whole nephron, certain parts of it are in the cortex, certain parts of it are in the medulla. The glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule, and the proximal tubule were all located in the cortex layer. So things are going to get a little bit different as we move from the cortex and into the loop of Henle, which is mostly in the medulla. So we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So the loop of Henle uh, has two major parts to it. It has what is called a descending limb. So this is the part on the left here that is connected to the proximal tubule. It has an apex right there, right at the very bottom, at the deepest part of the medulla. And then it has an ascending limb as it starts to connect to the distal convoluted tubule. And then furthermore, structurally speaking, the ascending limb here has a thin segment down here and a thick segment right here. The thick segment being what is closest to the distal convoluted tubule. Most of what we're going to accomplish here is going to be in the thick segment of the ascending limb. So even though chronologically speaking, the filtrate that's coming from the proximal tubule is going to hit the descending limb first, what I want us to talk about first is the ascending limb, because what the ascending limb is going to do for us is set the table for all the stuff that the descending limb is going to uh, do for us. So let's talk about that. So the de uh, excuse me, the thick segment of the ascending limb here is doing essentially the exact same thing that the proximal tubule did. It is pumping out sodium and chloride ions from the filtrate, and what that is doing is it is going to increase the uh, uh, osmolarity of the interstitial fluid here. So as all of this solute moves out into the interstitial fluid of the medulla, the osmolarity is going to go way, 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 way up. In the proximal tubule, the osmolarity didn't really end up changing a whole lot because water followed by osmosis and that allowed things to kind of even out. Well, that's not gonna happen here, and for one very important reason. The ascending limb of the loop of Henle is not permeable to water. So even though we're pumping all the salt out, we're creating these huge water gradients, these huge osmolarity gradients, water cannot follow by osmosis through the thick segment of the ascending limb because that ascending limb is not permeable to water. So keep that in mind. So what we're doing here as we pump salt out of the ascending limb is we are driving up and up and up and up the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid of the medulla. So up here in the cortex, the interstitial fluid has had an osmolarity of 300 milliosmolar, the exact same as the blood plasma, right? Down here in the medulla, things are very, very, very different down here in the medulla because of all this water transport, or excuse me, because of all this salt transport, the osmolarity of the medullary interstitial fluid is 1400 milliosmolar. So that's really, really, really high. So it seems really high, but this is exactly what is going to allow us to get more water reabsorption to occur. 
So if we now look at the descending limb, which again, chronologically speaking, is the first part of the loop of Henle that receives that 300 milliosmolar uh, filtrate from the uh, proximal tubule, when that filtrate was up here in the cortex layer, as it's making its way down into the loop of Henle, we could not possibly get any more water reabsorption to occur here because, as we said, the osmolarity of the filtrate was the same as the interstitial fluid of the cortex. As soon as this filtrate makes its way down into the medulla, now suddenly 300 milliosmolar is a lot less than 1400. So as soon as that filtrate makes its way down into the descending limb, we are immediately going to get a bunch of water reabsorption to occur. So you can see evidence of this because we go from 300 milliosmolar is the filtrate to 600, to 800, to 1000, to 1200. So we are sucking the water out of the filtrate, leaving less and less water and more and more salt behind. So as we reabsorb water back into those intertubular capillaries, the osmolarity of the filtrate is going to go up and up and up until at the apex of the loop of Henle here, it is eventually going to have so much water sucked out that it will now be isoosmotic with the medullary interstitial fluid, which is 1400. At that point, we can no longer reabsorb any more water, right? And then it's also worth mentioning that water reabsorption here is very efficient because the descending limb is not permeable to salt. So the very the simplest way I think of thinking about this is think that the descending limb only deals with water. The ascending limb only deals with salts. Neither of them are going to do both water or uh, and salts, right? So at this point, uh, we are concentrating the filtrate. So again, the filtrate moves into the loop of Henle at 300 milliosmolar, meaning there's a lot of water there. We start reabsorbing the water into the capillaries. That concentrates the filtrate as we make our way through the descending limb. And then now we're going into the ascending limb, which we already talked about. So as we start actively pumping those so sodium and chloride ions out to keep the osmolarity of the medulla high, we are now going to bring the osmolarity of the filtrate back down. So we concentrate it here and then we dilute it here. So we suck water out in the descending limb, we suck salts out in the ascending limb. So that by the time the filtrate makes its way back up the ascending limb and back out of the medulla and into the cortex layer again, this filtrate is now going to be a uh, hypoosmotic to the blood plasma. You can see we get as low as 100 uh, milliosmolar at that point. So this whole system that we've just described here in which we promote water reabsorption by increasing the osmolarity of the medullary interstitial fluid, this is sometimes called the countercurrent multiplier system. So basically, it's just a trick that we play to reabsorb more water and to do some salt reabsorption as well. So another thing that's worth mentioning at this point is another thing that is very heavily involved in uh, the function of the nephron is urea, which we understand is a nitrogenous waste product of amino acid metabolism. So every amino acid contains nitrogen. So when you break down amino acids, you're naturally going to release some of that nitrogen waste as urea. So uh, urea is this waste product that also is going to help us contribute to the osmolarity of our blood, urine, and interstitial fluids. So uh, without getting into too terribly much detail here, uh, the ascending uh, loop of Henle and then the lower portions of the collecting duct over here are actually very permeable to urea. So your, what urea kind of helps us to do, you can kind of see the movement of urea here in yellow. What it helps us essentially to do is to compensate for the fact that the thin segment of the ascending limb down here, we mostly talked about the thick segment, the thin segment is impermeable to salts, which can kind of cause a little bit of disruption in the countercurrent multiplier system. So the urea transport that we see here kind of helps to compensate for that. And then ure some urea does actually get recycled through the medullary interstitial fluid. Its primary purpose there is basically just to keep the osmolarity high enough so that we can promote water reabsorption the way that we just described.
So at this point, let's go ahead and review one more time. So we, t again, starting from the beginning, we talked about filtration here in Bowman's capsule. We produce a very high volume of filtrate that is at 300 milliosmolar. Here in the proximal tubule, we reabsorb a bunch of that water, all without changing the osmolarity of the filtrate. But as soon as we make it down into the medulla, you can kind of see here in this picture exactly where you make your way into the medulla, right where the loop of Henle starts. We reabsorb more water, we reabsorb some salt, and now we are going to make our way into the distal convoluted tubule, and then eventually into the collecting duct, which is what you see highlighted here with this purple rectangle. And it is going to be the collecting duct that will eventually deliver this, what we would now call urine, to the renal calyces for delivery through the ureters to the bladder. Okay, so before we start talking about the distal tubule, remember that by this point, the filtrate, as it makes its way back into the cortex, is now going to be hypotonic, hypoosmotic to the blood plasma. Uh, by the time it reaches the collecting duct uh, due to uh, those salt excreting properties of the ascending limb. So essentially we suck so much salt out of this filtrate. By this point, we leave mostly water left over, what little water we have not yet reabsorbed uh, into uh, the distal tubule. Uh, so this means now if you look out here in the distal tubule where we're at kind of 200 or 100 milliosmolar, water is going to want to diffuse by osmosis from the collecting duct lumen to the interstitial fluid. So we naturally create an ideal situation where water can move from an area of low osmolarity to, again, an area of higher osmolarity. So once we get to the collecting duct at about 200 or 100, water is going to move from the filtrate from the lower osmolarity to the blood plasma, which again is at 300. So uh, we're not really going to talk a whole lot about the collecting duct. We do uh, do some reabsorption of some salts, uh, things like a little bit more sodium, a little bit of potassium. Uh, we'll do some hydrogen ion uh, reabsorption here, uh, just in cases where the blood plasma is a little too acidic and we need to get some of that extra hydrogen into the urine. But for the most part, we're just going to make our way right here into... Uh, the collecting duct here. So the distal tubule doesn't really do a whole lot of water reabsorption. You can tell that that's the case because uh, at the end of the loop of Henle, we're at 100 milliosmolar, and then by the time we completely make our way through the distal tubule, we're still at 100. So clearly we didn't do a whole lot of water reabsorption there. Any further water reabsorption we do, uh, absent what we've already talked about with the proximal tubule and the descending limb of the loop of Henle, any further water reabsorption is going to be done here in the collecting duct. So you can see all these little arrows pointing out, telling you that water is leaving the filtrate at that point and producing a more concentrated urine. So regardless of where you are in the nephron, you want to absolutely make sure you can keep track of the osmolarity changes in both the renal filtrate and in the surrounding extracellular fluid, especially as it pertains to the medullar extracellular fluid. So we still have some stuff to talk about with water reabsorption in the collecting duct because as we are going to see, uh, how much water gets reabsorbed in the collecting duct is going to depend a little bit. Specifically, it's going to depend on whether antidiuretic hormone is present or not. So we're finally going to learn the exact mechanism behind how antidiuretic hormone works. Up until this point, all we really knew about it is that it's a hormone that is secreted by the posterior pituitary, and it basically inhibits water reabsorption in the kidneys decreases urine volume in cases when we get dehydrated, right? That's all we really knew about it up until this point. So we still have some stuff to talk about that, so we'll get to that eventually. Uh, but this table right here is, again, one of those things that I recommend you bookmark for your studying purposes. You can kind of see exactly what sorts of things happen in each part of the nephron. So proximal tubule, we obviously talked about how you get active transport of salts, and then water will follow by osmosis descending limb, no salt transport. We said uh, that descending limb is impermeable to salts, uh, but very permeable to water. And then it's the exact opposite with the thick seg segment. Uh, 
Uh, the distal tubule, like we said, will get some more salt reabsorption, will get some hydrogen ion reabsorption, but not really any uh, uh, reabsorption of water. Uh, not really. It's It kind of hedges it down here and says there is some in the distal, uh, kind of in the last part of the distal tubule, but at that point we're practically in the uh, collecting duct. So uh, the collecting duct, like we said, we will get a little bit more salt reabsorption, but most of what we're trying to accomplish there is maybe some more reabsorption of water, maybe not. It's all going to depend on antidiuretic hormone. So let's talk about something that's very, very important, something that I think is going to help us understand both what is going to happen in the collecting duct and what already did happen in the loop of Henley. So if you recall way, way, way back to chapter three, when we talked about the structure and function of the plasma membrane, we said the plasma membrane is impermeable to polar molecules, and this includes water, right? So how did we explain how osmosis actually occurs? If water is cannot move through plasma membranes very well, how does osmosis occur so rapidly? So if you'll recall, it is because we said Almost every cell in the body has these aquaporin channels. It's basically these water channels that are pretty much always open, provide a free passage for water molecules to move from one side of the membrane to another via facilitated diffusion, so long as that water is moving from high concentration to low concentration. So you'll recall, I specifically said, most cells in the body have these aquaporin channels. Now, if I'm using the term most, that obviously implies that there are some cells in the body that do not have these aquaporin channels. Well, our clue there is we already said that there are certain parts of the nephron that are impermeable to water. Well, if they're impermeable to water, guess why that is? It's because those parts of the nephron, like the distal tubule, like the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, it's because they don't have aquaporins. We don't get any water reabsorption there because there are no aquaporins there. So it's nice to kind of see the connection there between what we're talking about here at the end of the semester and what we talked about at the very beginning. Okay, so now let's talk about antidiuretic hormone. At this point, I'm sure you have at least a basic appreciation for what this hormone uh, essentially accomplishes, at least in the framework of a homeostatic loop in terms of maintaining the osmolarity of the blood. But let's talk about specifically how this hormone works on the kidneys. So you will, review, uh, you will remember that antidiuretic hormone, also called arginine vasopressin, is a hormone that is secreted by the posterior pituitary in response to hyperosmotic stress sensed by the hypothalamus. So when the osmolarity of the blood plasma gets a little too high, such as when we get dehydrated, the hypothalamus senses that, signals to the posterior pituitary, and we are going to secrete antidiuretic hormone into the blood. Remember, that's what a hormone is. It's a signaling molecule that gets into the blood. So all we really said about antidiuretic hormone before is that its effector, its target that has antidiuretic hormone receptors is the kidneys. That's kind of vague, especially now that we know all these different structures of the kidneys. So the specific cells in the kidneys that have antidiuretic hormone receptors are the epithelial cells that make up the collecting duct. So what antidiuretic hormone is going to do is bind to those receptors and that is going to stimulate the delivery of extra aquaporin channels to be integrated into the plasma membrane of the collecting duct cells. So if you look at this picture here, in the absence of antidiuretic hormone, those aquaporin channels are just kind of hanging out here in this cytoplasmic vesicle, not a part of the plasma membrane where they need to be if they were going to stimulate osmosis. So those aquaporin channels are just kind of in a holding pattern at this point. But when antidiuretic hormone binds to its surface receptor, this activates a signal transduction cascade that will signal those aquaporin uh, channels to be integrated into the membrane. And at that point, they can now allow water to move from, high, uh, from low osmolarity to high osmolarity from the filtrate and back into the blood. So if we go backwards here, to this figure, you can actually see here that uh, as 
uh, the osmolarity of the filtrate that enters the collecting duct is 100, we will reabsorb some water back into the uh, capillaries at this point until we get to 300. And then as we make our way into the medulla, where again, the interstitial fluid osmolarity is 1400, whether we get any more water reabsorption to occur is all going to depend on whether these collecting duct cells have the aquaporins or not. So if we are very well hydrated, there should not be very many aquaporin channels here, meaning we're not going to do a whole lot of extra water reabsorption. So there's going to be an unusual, unusually high concentration of water in the urine that we excrete out. But in cases when we are dehydrated and we want to preserve that water, we definitely want antidiuretic hormone to stick some aquaporin channels in the collecting duct cells. We'll reabsorb a bunch of that water back into the blood plasma where we want it to be, which means that when you're dehydrated, the urine that you excrete, if any, is going to be very low in water concentration and very high in salts and waste products, which is why dehydrated urine is going to be less clear and more of kind of a dark yellow color. Another thing that you might want to kind of take note of is the mechanism of how antidiuretic hormone works here is very reminiscent of insulin and how insulin provides the signal for the insertion of GLUT4 channels into the cell membranes of skeletal muscle and uh, 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 adipose tissue cells uh, that we talked about before in chapter 17. So the whole idea here is that by virtue of antidiuretic hormone now increasing the permeability of the collecting duct to water, we can reabsorb more water from the filtrate into the blood plasma, meaning that the urine is going to become more concentrated in salts and urochrome and other sorts of things, and there's going to be less water and therefore less urine produced. Okay, so at this point, we have talked about pretty much every single function of the nephron except for secretion. We've talked about filtration. We've talked about reabsorption. We have not yet talked about secretion yet. So with secretion, a substance is going to be transported from the peritubular capillaries and back into the filtrate. So we are going to reserve this process for ridding the blood of materials that we don't want in the blood and we want to excrete out through the urine. We probably already got a whole bunch of that out through the filtration process, but now we're going to get the rest of it. So one of the major things that gets secreted out through the urine is toxins and drugs and things of that nature, right? So uh, uh, bad, bad, bad things that we don't want to be in the blood, we want to excrete them out as soon as possible. So two different types of transporters that are going to be located throughout the nephron uh, are called organic anion transporters, or OATs, or organic cation transporters, or OCTs. So these things are going to be all over the place. Uh, namely, they're going to be in the proximal tubule. There will be some in the distal tubule too. So for example, if you're type taking a drug like penicillin, once it has kind of run its course in inhibiting bacterial growth within the body, uh, penicillin will get cleared out of the blood by the actions of OAT transporters. So penicillin doesn't get completely removed by uh, filtration, so we rid ourselves of excess of it by transporting it from the peritubular blood and into the filtrate at that point. Okay, so let's talk about one more subject here. The issue of glucose and amino acids. So one thing that we definitely mentioned for sure, and we'll see this when we do our urinalysis virtual activity here in just a little bit, uh, glucose is something that has absolutely no problem making it through the filtration process. So that initial filtrate in Bowman's capsule and the proximal tubule is actually going to have quite a lot of glucose in it, right? But we know that mature urine that gets excreted out should not have any glucose in it at all. In fact, if you do have glucose in the urine, that's usually a pretty good sign that someone is diabetic of some sort, right? So let's, if we're not getting rid of glucose out of the, out of the filtrate via uh, anything besides reabsorption, there's obviously a whole lot of reabsorption of glucose that happens after the filtrate is actually formed. So there's a lot of glucose in the filtrate. If there's no glucose in the urine, that must be because we reabsorbed it all back into the blood, pl uh, blood plasma. So let's talk about that. 
So like I said, the final urine product should not contain detectable amounts of glucose or amino acids, as both should be completely reabsorbed after initial filtrate formation. So if you look at the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule here, the filtrate, like we said, has a whole lot of glucose. So we are going to want to transport it across the apical membrane here into the proximal tubule cell and then across the basolateral membrane and into the peritubular capillaries. So what this is going to look an awful lot like is the uh, absorption of glucose in the intestines. If you'll remember how we did that, when you eat something, the absorption of glucose across the intestinal epithelia, it's gonna look almost exactly like what happens here. So what's gonna happen is almost exactly the same. We are going to use secondary active transport to transport both sodium and glucose from the filtrate here in the kidney lumen, uh, the lumen of the proximal tubule into the proximal tubule cell. Facilitated diffusion will allow glucose to move down its concentration gradient and into the blood plasma. And then of course we use uh, the sodium potassium pump down here to maintain that sodium gradient so that glucose can always continue to move in here. So if you don't quite recall this, you may want to go back to that discussion that we had. I think it was in chapter three. We talked about this sort of thing in much greater detail there. Essentially, the exact same thing is happening here. So you may want to go back to chapter three and uh, uh, review that. And if, if I'm misremembering and it's not chapter three, send me an email and I will definitely make sure I look into it and direct you to the right place. But I'm pretty sure it's in chapter three. Okay, so the very last thing for us to discuss in this chapter is we're finally going to discuss one of the major hormone systems involved in the regulation of things like blood pressure, sodium, and potassium throughout the body. So this all has to do with a, a, one of our old hormones that we've mentioned, but we haven't really said a whole lot about, aldosterone. So before you move any further forward, make sure you go back to chapter 17 and make sure you review what aldosterone is. What class of hormone is it? Where is it produced? What types of cells does it tend to act on? So you want to make sure that you're at least familiar with those pieces of information before we go any further. So if you remember from earlier in the chapter, a lot of sodium is going to get reabsorbed in the, uh, it, from the initial glomerular filtrate by those active transport processes, uh, both in the proximal tubule and then we'll do some in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And that's all going to set the table for the concurrent reabsorption of water uh, in the descending limb, right? So what we have not talked about is potassium, right? So some potassium does get reabsorbed too, but we haven't really talked about that in any great detail. So what aldosterone is going to really do for us here is help us to regulate the amount of sodium and potassium that is in the blood because there may be times when we have too much sodium or not enough potassium or vice versa. And hopefully this late in the semester in our human physiology course, you don't need me to tell you why it's so important to have the correct concentrations of sodium and potassium because we've certainly spent lots of time talking about the sodium potassium gradients, how they're used for secondary active transport, how they are essential for action potentials and everything like that. So hopefully I don't need to spend too much time talking about why keeping the concentrations of sodium and potassium regulated is very important. So aldosterone is going to be the hormone that helps us to accomplish this. So first let's talk about what aldosterone does once aldosterone is produced by the adrenal cortex and once it gets into the blood and once it gets to its target cells. So aldosterone is going to get into the blood as all hormones do. Don't forget that it is a steroid hormone, so it's going to need a carrier in the blood. So as a steroid hormone, as a hydrophobic hormone, its receptor is going to be inside of its target cells. Specifically, we're talking about the cells of the distal tubule and the collecting duct. So once aldosterone binds to its excuse me, once it binds to its nuclear hormone receptor, its internal receptor inside the cell, the end result is going to be these cells are going to start synthesizing ion channels that help us to promote sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. 
One thing you may or may not remember is that anytime you're dealing with a steroid hormone, it's always going to have a similar effect on target cells. And that end result is always going to be some type of protein synthesis. It's something that we mentioned back in chapter 17. In the case of aldosterone, the protein that gets synthesized here is a sodium-potassium antiporter. So when these new channels are inserted into uh, the apical side of these uh, collecting duct and distal tubule cells, this is going to allow sodium to move from the uh, filtrate and into the blood, and it's going to allow potassium to move from the blood and into the filtrate. So we are antiporting sodium and potassium here. We are increasing the amount of sodium in the blood and decreasing the amount of potassium in the blood. So, like I said, this will happen, uh, part of it will happen in the distal tubule, but most of what's going to happen here is in the cortical part of the collecting duct, the part of the collecting duct which is up in the cortex, not so much in the medulla. So, what you can see here is that for both sodium and potassium, a lot of that sodium reabsorption happens there in the proximal tubule and the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Potassium happens again in the proximal tubule and the distal tubule, but these reabsorptions are going to happen at a very constant unregulated rate, meaning depending on kind of our uh, salt intake, depending on what we're drinking, what we're eating, uh, this unregulated constant rate may not be appropriate to what we've done in terms of our eating and drinking behaviors, right? So if some adjustments are needed, then aldosterone is going to help us do that. So if, say, we reabsorb too much potassium here, then aldosterone is going to help us secrete some of that extra potassium there in the collecting duct, right? So this is the basic takeaway from this. Because aldosterone promotes the reabsorption of sodium and the secretion of potassium, aldosterone is going to be secreted in cases when sodium is low in the blood and potassium is high. Conversely, if sodium is high and potassium is low, aldosterone will not be secreted and we can just let the unregulated constant rate of reabsorption in the kidneys take care of everything naturally. But here is the deal. Aldosterone secretion in the uh, adrenal cortex, which is right on top of the kidney, how we actually get that hormone to be secreted is kind of a terribly complicated thing. So if you'll recall, anytime we're going to secrete a hormone, there has to be a sensory mechanism. There has to be some sensor that triggers eventually the hormone to be secreted. So we have not yet talked about that. So the sensory mechanism is actually right at home here in the nephron. Specifically, it is this structure called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So if we take a quicker look at the nephron here, you will notice that if you look at the glomerulus here, you have the afferent arterioles bringing blood in and then the efferent arterioles bringing blood out. Right at the crossroads of those two arterioles is the distal convoluted tubule. So these three things, if you kind of think of them as three different roads, they're all kind of converging at the same point. And that point of convergence is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. There is a collection of cells here at this interface called granular cells and the macula densa, which collectively together make up the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is going to be where our sensor is located that tells us, are we going to need aldosterone or are we not going to need aldosterone? So say we're at a case where dietary intake of salt is poor. So that means sodium is going to be low in the blood. So absolutely, we are going to need aldosterone. Well, another consequence of low salt is that the blood volume is going to fall because we are keeping antidiuretic hormone inhibited. So naturally, as things progress and we continue to urinate with an osmolarity that is still fairly low, eventually the blood volume is going to start going down, and that's going to be a whole other issue as well. So this drop in blood flow, keep in mind when your blood volume falls, so is your blood pressure. So we actually have baroreceptor cells here in the juxtaglomerular apparatus that will sense that drop in blood flow. And this is going to cause these cells to secrete a hormone, not aldosterone, but rather a hormone called renin.
So Renan is going to get into the blood and I should have already at this point made a separate video that goes into more detail on the Renan, Angiotensin, Aldosterone system. So definitely watch that here after you're done here. But essentially what Renan is going to do is get into the blood and it is going to convert an inactive protein in the blood called angiotensinogen. Uh, just a kind of a pro tip in the future. Uh, when you go to nursing school or wherever you're going, anytime you see a gen at the end of a molecule, that molecule is most likely inactive. So something's going to have to happen to that molecule before it actually gets activated. So this inactive protein in the blood called angiotensinogen, which is produced in the liver, uh, renin produced in the juxtaglomerular apparatus will trigger for angiotensinogen to be cleaved by an enzyme to produce the active form called angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will go through the blood into the pulmonary capillaries and the lungs of all places. The, uh, the cells of the lungs are going to produce an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. You've probably heard of ACE inhibitors before. Angiotensin converting enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And then eventually angiotensin 2 is going to get to the adrenal cortex and finally stimulate the release of aldosterone. Like I said, it's terribly complicated, but you know, there's nothing we can really do about that, right? So a couple of things are going to happen here. Angiotensin 2 on its own can actually have vasoconstrictive effects. It can actually bind to receptors on the smooth muscle of arterioles to raise the blood pressure to kind of deal with our drop in blood pressure. But angiotensin 2 is not really going to do a whole lot for our low sodium content. So that's why angiotensin 2 will stimulate aldosterone production, which again, aldosterone will get to the collecting duct cells to promote sodium reabsorption at that point. Okay, but what about when everything is fine? There's no drop in blood volume, there's no drop in blood pressure, sodium levels are fine. When everything is hunky-dory, uh, renin production is going to be inhibited by cells in the juxtaglomerular apparatus called the macula densa. So it's these granular cells that we're making the renin. The macula densa cells, which are part of the... Uh, 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 distal tubule are going to secrete paracrine signals that inhibit the production of renin. So basically, when everything's fine, renin production, which started the whole angiotensin aldosterone system, that renin is never going to get secreted at that point. So like I said, this is a terribly complicated thing in my opinion. So if we kind of review this from start to finish, it was renin secretion here in the uh, juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidneys. Renin gets into the blood. Uh, the liver produces angiotensinogen. Those two acting together will trigger the production of angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 gets into the pulmonary capillaries where angiotensin converting enzyme will convert it to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 separately can stimulate vasoconstriction of, of arterioles to raise your blood pressure back up. And then angiotensin 2 will also get to the adrenal cortex to stimulate the production of aldosterone, which then acts on the cortical collecting duct to promote sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion. So yeah, not a trivial thing to kind of keep track of. So it's going to take some practice for you to really kind of get all this to click into place, but hey, I know you can do it, right? Okay, so here's kind of one final thing to help us to kind of appreciate the difference between what antidiuretic hormone does for us and what aldosterone does for us. So keep in mind, antidiuretic hormone is reserved for cases in which the blood osmolarity falls. That just because the osmolarity of the blood or has risen. So just because the osmolarity of the blood has risen, that doesn't mean that the blood volume is off, right? So antidiuretic hormone is reserved for cases when the osmolarity goes up. So if the blood volume falls, that doesn't necessarily mean that the osmolarity is off. So in those cases, we can't count on antidiuretic hormone to fix things for us.
So if, say, we deal with that same issue that sodium intake is low, the blood volume goes down, well, antidiuretic hormone is going to be suppressed, right? Because there's no problem necessarily with the osmolarity of the blood. So that's why we need the juxtaglomerular apparatus to trigger this whole sequence of events, renin converting angiotensin tensinogen to angiotensin 1, ACE converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, aldosterone and all that good stuff. So just make sure that it kind of makes sense in your head why antidiuretic hormone is distinct from aldosterone. Certainly that's something that we can discuss in our final collaborate meeting of the semester, but we'll go ahead and leave it there for now. So there are other things that we could have discussed here in the urinary system. It's really pretty fascinating, but this should give you a very, very, very good uh, a foundation for all the different things that the kidneys and the other parts of the urinary system accomplish for us. So we'll go ahead and cut it off here for now. Uh, thanks again for your attention, and I will see you next time if there's a next time. If you are a spring 2020 student, this is our last lecture of the semester. Thanks again for dealing with the whole COVID-19 issue, and I will see you later.